The DX7 came along in 1983 and changed everything that we knew about synthesizers, about the sound of pop music. It just changed everything. Probably the biggest successful synthesizer before that was the Prophet 5. And, you know, that was really the first commercially successful polyphonic analog synth. And, you know, it, it was like most other synths of the time. It was covered with knobs and controls and buttons, and it was a very tactile interface. It just had a, a certain look, and that's all we knew. Um, and then the DX7 came along, and it looked like a spaceship. It was flat and sleek, and it had a smooth surface. There were no buttons sticking up. It had this membrane panel. Uh, the buttons were mounted underneath that, and it was a conscious departure from everything we knew. You know, and and um, not just physically and and aesthetically, but sonically, the way it sounded. Synthesizers until that time were they were known for being warm and lush and fat and and all these things that we that we call good. And everybody fell in love with the DX7, probably because it was just so radically different. It presented itself in a way that was sharp, and the attacks were crisp and clean and precise and so it was known for sounds with that kind of character bell sounds and and harpsichords clav sounds of course the electric piano sounds that that everybody remembers from the dx7 it changed everything and it defined the better part of a decade all of a sudden the sound of the dx7 was everywhere you heard it for you know a good 10 12 15 years you know, looking back, it, it really left a mark on not just music, but pop culture. You saw it everywhere. Anytime a band played, they had a DX7. If you didn't have one, you just were not one of the big boys. The problem was, for a 10-year-old kid like me at the time in 1983, there's no way that I could afford a DX7, let alone the things that came after. The DX5, the TX816 which was a rack mount version essentially, but it wasn't just one DX7, it was eight DX7s in a modular rack case. And uh, that thing was a game changer. And that is more where we get into what DX Dreams represents. Why DX Dreams over a plugin like Dext or OP7 or Arturia's DX7 or FM8? They all do something really unique, but they serve very different purposes. It's really apples and oranges. A single plugin like Dext or OP7 or Arturia's DX7, they all uh, essentially are modeling a single DX7. That's what they do. That's what they're good at. And, uh, and I love them for that. But still, the, the thing is, they only are giving you the equivalent of a single DX7. So you would need, if you were going to even try to compare them to, to DX Dreams, you would need at least eight instances of those plugins to match just one sound in DX Dreams. Uh, many of the sounds, I should say, in DX Dreams are made up of multiple layers of hardware. Uh, a, an original DX7, a customized DX5 with vastly improved circuitry. The output circuitry was customized uh, for that and a TX-816. So that's 8 plus 2 with the DX-5 engines and the, the DX-7. So that's 11 DX-7 engines playing at the same time. And not only that, they were all run through an analog console, analog mic preamps, um, British 1073 style preamps, different analog tape models, the Roland Dimension D chorus, and the AMS RMX-16 reverb. So with DX Dreams, it's just a wholly different approach. It's more a, um, a snapshot of those big, layered, iconic sounds of the 80s. It's delivered in a way that is eminently playable, very musical. It's not clinical. Where a Dext, for example, or the Arteria, they will give you a faithful recreation of a single DX7. They're never going to give you those big, massive, layered sounds. And again, even if you layered eight instances, it's still going to be a very different presentation just because you're doing it all in the box versus what happens when you run 11 channels through analog summing and analog preamps and analog tape and all the other stuff. It's a different type of sound 
and they, they serve different purposes. DX Dreams also includes two other things that really set it apart from other virtual DX7s. Um, one of them is the Blair Masters Legacy Grand Piano. Um, that's normally a separate purchase, but it's included in DX Dreams because so many of those iconic uh, piano, electric piano layers, that's, that just goes right along with the DX7. Uh, anytime you want to do any kind of David Foster, Chicago type, you know, stuff, you're going to need a great piano. And so I just thought that was a crucial ingredient. So the Blair Masters Legacy Grand is, is part of DX Dreams. And lastly, it includes a custom reverb impulse taken from the AMS RMX-16, which was um, a crucial ingredient in 80s pop music. You heard, whether you know it or not, the AMS reverb in dozens, if not hundreds, of major hits throughout the 80s. Mr. Mister used that a lot would be one example. Also, Level 42, um, Nick Kershaw, a lot of uh, British pop guys use that a lot for whatever reason. Genesis, oh my gosh, Genesis, Phil Collins used the AMS reverb all the time. And that, that reverb is very, very, um, very signature, if you will. It's the, the algorithm that I sample is called the nonlinear, nonlin preset. And it's a short reverb that, that has a rapid decay. And um, it's just something that I felt was important to include. And so that reverb impulse is under the hood in contact. It's built into every DX Dreams preset. And there's a control right on the front panel. It lets you dial in you know, the, the amount that you want. You're going to get all the effects that made it sound like you heard on the radio. The AMS reverb, a little saturation from the Neve 1073. Again, just little things that all add up to big differences. When I've told people about DX Dreams, uh, one of the comments I get quite a lot is, well, you can't really capture a DX7 with sampling. You've got to use modeling because a DX7 is very complex and there's just too many variations to be able to capture that with sampling. Those concerns are valid, but that doesn't mean it's not possible. It just means it hasn't been done right. The difficulty is that a DX7 really was essentially a, an early form of physical modeling. It used mathematically generated waveforms and it led to very, very complex sounds. And part of the thing that makes that difficult to capture is velocity sensitivity had a lot to do with how those sounds were rendered in real time as you played. If you played those electric piano sounds with a really soft touch, they would sound progressively brighter, their tone would change, their character would change the harder you hit. You can capture that. It just requires extreme attention to detail. If you want it to be completely accurate, you've got to capture chromatically every key across the keyboard. You can't cheat and capture every fourth note. Then you've got to capture a lot of velocity layers. That requires a lot of storage space. You know, early on, it just wasn't feasible to do uh, and to do it right. But now, with computers as powerful as they are, with storage space as cheap as it is, it can be done. I spent the better part of a year capturing these sounds and working with the hardware and just a being going back and forth, playing one note at a time, all the way up and down the keyboard, and listening to the detailed characteristics, the way that the note would respond at different velocity levels, the way that sounds would change when you let off the keys. A lot of DX7 patches behaved in a certain way when you would let go of the keys. And that's one thing that I modeled with envelopes and filters. There's a lot involved in getting those sounds accurate. For this to be right, for me to feel good about it, I wanted it to not just be a reasonable facsimile, I wanted you to be able to sit down with a TX-816 and a DX-5 and a DX-7 layered together and play those sounds in combination and then play DX streams. And I wanted you to be able to shut your eyes and not be able to tell which is which. It is that detailed. So it can be done. It just hasn't been until now. First things first, it's important to know that the main stage slash logic version and the contact version serve really different purposes. I always develop these things in main stage first because it's just a lot more complex. The main idea with main stage is it serves live 
performers. You can do all sorts of things with graphics and, and create this elaborate on-screen environment. But the purpose of that is so that you can build a virtual keyboard rig and you can layer virtual sounds and plugins with your hardware. It was built from the ground up with that in mind. And every patch in DX Streams, for example, is all loaded and ready to go in the main stage version. Because the idea there is you can step through patch by patch as part of your live performance. The contact version is just meant to be like any other plugin. You use typically one sound at a time. Other than the, the multis, there is a folder of multis which are the big layered sounds. So of course, even though it's a, a layered sound within contact, it's still just one instance of contact. All the stuff that applies to main stage, the big graphical environment and the iPad controller that lets you play with uh, on-screen controls as you play, none of that applies to contact. So while the sounds are all the same between the two, the approach is simply different. So again, they do have all the same sounds, all the same content is there, it's just uh, approached differently. In contact, it's more of a load as you go, and if you want you know, something like a big reverb or whatever, you just simply add that after the fact, and uh, it just gives you more options, really, in the contact version. So last thing about uh, contact versus main stage. You know, for a long time, I said that I would not do a contact version. I swore that I would just stick to the main stage and Logic version because that platform just happens to be really, really good at recreating all the intricacies and all the little nuances of a DX7 sound. And so I didn't think it was possible to, to translate it into other formats and have it work. But thankfully, I was wrong. Um, the contact version just... <laughs> Unfortunately, I had to start completely from scratch. Other than the key mappings themselves, I had to strip everything down and start completely over. I had to explore the different filter options in contact, and I had to do it sound by sound. There's over 140 patches in DX Dreams, and I had to do this for every one of those patches. Some patches, one filter model might sound better than another. Um, I had to play with their envelopes and their LFOs to get even the, the modulation speed for certain sounds. It was hundreds and hundreds of hours working sound by sound to make them um, match, and I was able to do it. It just took forever. So have no fear. The contact version is not uh, compromised at all from the main stage version. They, um, they're just served on different plates. Why do DX Dreams at all? In 2021, 2022 now, with the contact version, there are several other ways to get DX7 sounds. The plugins, Dext, Arturia's DX7, OP7, FM8. Why not just get an old DX7? It's not a valid comparison. A single DX7 will give you some of the sounds in DX Dreams, but um, you're never going to get those big massive layered sounds, which is really what DX Dreams specializes in. To do that, you have to have a DX5 or a DX1. There were only 140 of those made, and now they're on reverb for $150,000, which is just insane. But anyway, you'd have to have several DX7s, or in some cases, 11 DX7s, to get the kind of sounds that are available in DX Dreams. You'd have to have the knowledge of how to program those sounds to create those big layers. And um, you'd have to have all the, the hardware that went along with it to really accurately create these sounds. Analog tape, British mic preamps, Dimension D, AMS reverb. You know, those are all part of the package. That's what you get when you get DX Dreams. You know, I think it's fair to say that this is kind of a love letter to my childhood. Being a, a kid born in the 70s, growing up in the 80s, I came of age during a decade when everything was fun and optimistic and innocent. And the music was a huge part of that. That stuff was the soundtrack of my life. And it's probably the same for a lot of you. The problem is, when I finally got my hands on my own DX7 in 1989, well, the D50 had come out by then, and the Core Gem 1, and all of a sudden, 
a DX7 just wasn't all that cool anymore. It was uh, revealed for what it was. It was mono. It, it had no built-in effects. And so I remember finally getting one and thinking, man, this doesn't sound anything like what I'm hearing on the radio. All these songs that I've grown up with, they sound so big. And I realized later on it was because the way they were produced. A lot of those sounds, like the Toto records in particular, and David Foster and Chicago and uh, you know, Scritti Politti and, and um, Simple Minds and Mr. Mister, they all were using the TX-816. So many of those DX sounds were those big layers. I wanted to provide essentially a curated museum piece, a snapshot of a moment in time where it was not possible for a kid like me to have a DX7, let alone a TX816 or a DX5, the stuff that my musical idols all had. So here I am in my, you know, end of my 40s, and I've had all this stuff now, and I've had the, the joy of owning it and playing it. And I just thought, why not create a way for others to experience something that that most will never get the chance to, to experience. And so that's what DX Dreams is. It's a time capsule. It's a way to play and connect with a part of history. I hope that doesn't sound lofty, you know, or overly dramatic or whatever, but, but that's what it is for me. You know, these, these sounds, they're a powerful reminder. They're a powerful uh, way of connecting with, you know, days gone by. So I hope that's what it is for you. These, these sounds are meant to evoke good memories, and, um, and they're still relevant. They're still relevant today. That's the other thing. You don't have to use DX Dreams just to recreate the glory days of the 80s. You can use this stuff now in a modern context. You know, Synthwave is obviously still huge. That's the reason for this. You can get a simple bass sound out of Dexter or OP7 or whatever, and those are great for that. But I don't know of any other way to get the stuff that DX Dream specializes in. It's meant to be big and lush and fully produced and radio ready. I hope that these sounds mean as much to you as they do to me. Um, it was a huge, huge effort to, to pull this off and to do it right. And uh, this is the only way I know how to do it. And um, I hope that you find the same satisfaction and joy in in playing these sounds as I had in creating them. Uh, and I sure have fun playing them. So there you go. I hope that that answers uh, all the main questions I've gotten about DX Dreams, particularly what sets it apart from other uh, virtual DX7s. If there's something I haven't covered, feel free to get in touch. You can reach me by my website. And um, I'll be glad to hear from you. Thank you. <laughs>